In 1924, André Breton published his first Manifesto of Surrealism. It began with these words. So strong is the belief in life, in what is most fragile in life, real life I mean, that in the end this belief is lost. Man, that inveterate dreamer, daily more discontent with his destiny, has trouble assessing the objects he has been led to use. Breton goes on to state, if he still retains a certain lucidity, all he can do is turn back towards his childhood, which however his guides and mentors may have botched it, still strikes him as somehow charming. There, the absence of any known restrictions allows him the perspective of several lives lived at once. About a third of the way into the manifesto, Breton begins employing the term merveilleux, the marvelous, to describe the essence of surrealism. Let us not mince words, he writes. The marvelous is always beautiful. Anything marvelous is beautiful. In fact, only the marvelous is beautiful. The concept of the marvelous is critical to surrealism. The marvelous is a metaphysical concept and relates to the ultimate meaning of reality. Surrealism rejects reason and challenges the idea that to be human is to be rational, a position that contradicts some of the oldest ideas in Western philosophy. Aristotle was already defining humans as rational animals back in the 4th century BCE. For Breton, this emphasis on rationality, reason, and order leads to alienation. Surrealism aims to overturn that estrangement by accessing the subconscious in an effort to regain an original sense of wonder. The marvelous is achieved through an immersion in the senses. A new reality is created that is beyond the reach of reason and rationality. While Breton's manifesto was primarily directing literary work, he acknowledged that his theories applied to all creative endeavors. They are particularly relevant to the practices of collage and assemblage. Creating a new reality is certainly a daunting task, but the surrealists provide us with some starting points. Embrace immediacy, establish new dialogues through juxtaposition, inject elements of surprise, welcome the consequences of randomness, explore uncommon imagery to create personal iconographies, and most important, listen to your dreams. Hi, I'm Jeff Radermel. I'm an artist, educator, researcher, and curator. I live and work in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis-St. Paul in the state of Minnesota. Minnesota is located relatively in the middle of the United States, way up north. Conveniently located next to Canada, where they are refreshingly humble, they use the metric system, and they have national health care. My formal training is as a printmaker, paper maker, and book artist. These disciplines, for me, share three things that I enjoy. Uh, one of them is, is that planning process before you start out. The second is repetition. I like that zen-like feeling that I can get from pulling sheets of paper or printing uh, pages for a book. And the last one is the tactility, that, uh, that joy of using your hands. Printmaking allows me to reproduce images to make them less precious. Whenever you have just one of something, uh, it puts a lot of pressure on you to take care of it. Paper making allows me to add content to the substrates that I work on. And the book arts provide an alternative method of presentation. Uh, one that allows a closer and more intimate exchange between myself and viewer readers. I am an advocate of learning how to do something correctly before breaking the rules. But after you reach a degree of proficiency, 
strict protocols can be confining. Things like every print in addition needs to be identical. Quality handmade paper should be free of holes. Books must be produced in multiple, and registration marks should be erased or trimmed. It's necessary to obsess about the archivalness of materials, and you should do everything you can to guard your work from the hands of the public. These traditional realities can get in the way of creativity. Sometimes the best way to explore an idea is to escape. Void of any rules, collage allows me to determine where it needs to be. Whether it's three green dots or the torso of Keanu Reeves. As an artist, you are often asked who you have been influenced by. My list is eclectic and constantly evolving. I am fascinated by historical and current psychological theory. Mark Rothko's color sensibility is inspiring. John Cage's admiration of chance encounters. Zhu Bing's exploration of language. The Isemic writing and collage narratives of Max Ernst. The activism of the Gorilla Girls. The multiples and collaborative publications of Fluxus artists. The mathematical complexity of Baroque music. Yoko Ono's audacity and vulnerability. Robert Motherwell's sense of composition. The simple beauty of Deborah Butterfield's assemblages. The films of Andy Warhol that celebrate sexuality and the banal. Swiss design grids. Robert Ryman's persistence in exploring a very simple concept the white square, Hannah Hoek's storytelling, the melancholy poetry of Constantine Cavafe. With roses at the head and jasmine at the feet, this is what desires resemble that have passed without fulfillment. The disturbing yet provocative books and installations of Annette Messoget, the writings of Robin Wall Kimmerer, a professor of environmental forest biology and a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation who explores the intersections of native philosophy and scientific method. And this summer, flowers from my garden. Lots and lots of orange and purple. Unlike Breton, I am a reluctant manifesto author. A compilation of definitive statements can come back to haunt you. As an alternative, I asked Tom Cassidy, a Minneapolis collage and spoken word artist, to construct and ask me 23 questions that would provide insight into my personal philosophy. I was not provided the questions in advance, and we recorded the session in one take. I think you'll get a little sense of my attitude, and you certainly learn a lot about Tom's. During the interview, you will see images of Tom's work. I enjoy his combination of repurposed compositions, ephemera, mark-making, figurative drawing, and text. He is prolific in his output and often works collaboratively with artists such as visual poet John Bennett. Questions for Jeff Rathermill. What constitutes your favorite palette for collaging? Uh, blue. What rhymes poorly with the word collage? Dressage. What's the maximum number of pieces a simple collage should contain? Three. Who makes the best scissors for precision collaging? Oh, probably the Swiss. If you were to collage a few pieces from two famous collages, say one by Hannah Hawk and one by Picasso, into a new collage made up of five pieces only, <laughs> then you'd be sued for infringement. <laughs> I think they're both dead. How has the pandemic influenced your collaging? I have been using a lot of things that I have in my house. 
Collaging is perhaps the most deliberate, subversive, and aggressive form of cultural appropriation, copyright taunting, and infringement, getty shaming, third degree witchcraft, and overall art for those who are unable to draw. Why is it still practiced? Because of all of those reasons. Describe a few full or partial images you have cut out for use in a future collage, but have yet to use. Oh, uh, Michelangelo's uh, from the Sistine Chapel. No matter how great a collage is, there's always an item or bit or negative space that's visibly wrong and even physically distressing. Why can't anyone get it right? That is the whole idea of perfection. It's unattainable. Can't the simplest collaging app make a more appealing collage than the most complicated collagist? No. Do you commonly trim a torn edge of a piece of paper to be collaged because it doesn't look correctly torn? I try not to. Do you sign a collage or cut up your signature and paste parts of it throughout? I usually don't sign. If you put an assemblage containing three dozen pairs of scissors in a room overnight with 500 rolls of 1950s wallpaper, what will you find in that room the next morning? <laughs> Probably other things that I haven't put in a way. How can collaging continue to flourish in today's clear, tangible, coherent, fact-anchored, scientific, yet faith-infused environment? I think it's a reaction against all of those things. Why do you collage? It provides freedom and it gets me to uh, think quickly and spontaneously. Lately, a number of contestants on America's Got Talent have wept about either losing a grandparent to collaging or barely surviving the ingestion of a quart of rubber cement. <laughs> <laughs> While these tales of addictive collaging are moving, don't they actually romanticize the idea of the tortured artist and therefore, even if inadvertently, prompt impressionable viewers to think that they can only have talent if they had a bad collage-related event in their past? It's the evils of sniffing glue. Hallmark stores are planning to change the name of the bags of confetti they sell, currently called confetti, to collage in a bag so they can up the price from $1.49 to $3.99. Is that enough? Three ninety nine is mm -hmm. that enough? Yes. I think that you probably could go for that ten dollar price point and go to nine ninety nine. How can you determine if a collage is well intentioned? I think there's a sincerity in terms of the composition, and it just doesn't seem like it's overdone. For a collagist, is paper mache the gateway drug to assemblage? Huh. That's a good question. I suppose um, unless they are painting over. If I made three collages from a total of six 1950s Life Magazine pages, would you be able to take those three collages apart and put the pages back together like puzzles? I'm afraid that would be before my time. According to a survey by the American Institute for the Game Boggle, Beef Stew, and Collage, how many paper cuts and razor knife nicks does the average collagist get in a year? Oh, wow. Um, I don't think that's an appropriate question to ask me. If you sweep up your collaging area, are you part of the problem? I am. I am because I usually save all of that stuff. My work comes from either research, things I am interested in and then formally study, or gut reactions to narratives, environment, shapes, sounds, states of being, or simple questions like, why did I plant so many purple and orange flowers in my garden this year? In the case of research, I tend to do a lot up front and then stop that phase when I begin creating art. The process becomes reactive at that point, reflecting back on what I have learned. I rarely go back to the books because nonfiction is not my goal. It's my interpretation, my emotional responses, and ultimately my narrative. When a work is completed, it's not a scholarly study. It's an autobiography. Usually in projects, I set up some rules. It could be the materials I use, the color palette, the format, page sizes, or even the location where I work. Sometimes restrictions are imposed on me, and I like that. These days, I'm not going out and buying a lot of supplies, so I'm relying on what I have available at home. I find that some parameters and restrictions really help drive creativity. It seems counterintuitive, especially when combined with surrealist principles, but when everything is possible, it's overwhelming.
Most of what I do can be characterized as theme and variation. Because many of the concepts I'm interested in are complex or just plain unanswerable, I like to create work that comes together as a series. My reasoning is that maybe when taken as a whole, content will be clearer. And I like the idea of providing a few different entry points for viewers and readers. I try to make my work sessions free from analytical thinking. I lay the materials out and I go for it. I work rather quickly and prolifically. At the end of the session, I look at what I have done and sort the pieces into three piles. One is for those I like as they are. I set those aside and will not revisit them until the final editing of the series. The second pile is for those that need something more. I'll decide what that something is at the next session. The third pile is for what I call dogs. These are pieces that I'm not happy with and probably cannot be saved. I'll use these at later work sessions for experiments that might be fatal. Or maybe the sow's ear will become a silk purse. Editing is the final step. That is when I put my analytical hat back on and curate the series. Once I have made my selections, the project is done. But that doesn't mean the pieces that didn't make the cut are thrown away. They might end up as a starting point for something else. While I've been talking, you have been looking at an assemblage of experiments from past projects. I keep this in my studio and it functions as a sample book of surface treatments. My Hortensia series was begun when I was staying at a home in Mexico called Casa Hortensias. It was a beautiful place with gardens and fabulous views, but it was very, very isolated. I had a lot of time to reflect on the natural environment and make up stories in my head. The series is a narrative about an imaginary woman named Hortensia, which by the way is Latin for gardener, who only has her plants as companions. The Project Gutenberg project began when I was given boxes of books that had been destroyed when they were scanned for inclusion in an online library. For the project, I created a series of multiples that celebrated the materiality of these books. I approached the project like an archeologist excavating the boxes of pages, bindings, book covers, and forgotten tucked in ephemera with my scalpel and tweezers. Then I presented my findings in ways that accentuated the beauty of the fragments and elevated their aesthetic value by declaring them artifacts. My series about the theories of Hermann Rorschach began with quite a bit of research. I was interested in the famous psychological inkblot test, but also fascinated by our attraction to symmetry. On another level, the series is an investigation of changing definitions of deviance and the arbitrary nature of clinical diagnosis. In February of 2020, I was once again visiting Mexico and created a small suite of collages called Puerta Vallarta Real Estate. I relied on the many sales publications available to visitors for my source material. In terms of other materials, I was limited to the office and school supplies at the Little Corner store. The work is a reaction to the huge developments that are taking over and basically displacing nature. It's my commentary on the restructuring of land and water to better meet the expectations of foreign vacation home buyers. Plowing under the authentic to create a reality that is kind of Mexican, but not too Mexican. Before I begin talking about my current project, I need to give you some background. I have become increasingly interested in the life and work of Alexander Scriabin, a Russian composer and pianist who lived from 1872 to 1915. Early in his life, he was heavily influenced by the works of Frederick Chopin, but later he began to compose pieces that challenged traditional tonality. 
his interest in synesthesia also increased. Synesthesia is a perceptual phenomenon in which stimulation of one sensory pathway leads to involuntary experiences in a second. For example, hearing music prompts the experience of color. This is what Scriabin explored. Ultimately, he assigned each musical key a color, colors he thought best evoked the character of compositions. The key of C is red, while the key of B is blue. You are listening to compositions by Scriabin now, and other works have been featured in this video. So I have this ongoing thing for Scriabin, and it comes time for my annual production of decorative papers. During the summer, I outfit my garage as a studio where I can get as messy as I want. I create a batch of decorative papers to use in binding projects over the winter. This year, I'm making paste papers. I decided to really play with colors and use up the odds and ends of acrylic paint I had, even using those fluorescent oranges and pinks that had been loitering on the back shelf for quite some time. While making paste papers can be a very controlled process, I prefer a much freer approach. And that means I need to use waste sheets to corral my enthusiasm. To somewhat protect my table, I cut down a pile of brown grocery bags. While I was making paste papers, I was listening to a lot of Scriabin. After a session or two, I started to notice the accumulation of marks on the waste sheets. I liked them. Then, I noticed all the chatter that was occurring on the tape that was holding the paste papers down as they dried. I liked that too. And that's where all this surrealist stuff comes into play. In some way, the Scriabin music was influencing my process, the colors I chose, my gestures, even my mood. It was happening, but I was not actively thinking about it. Lots of happy accidents were occurring and I was embracing them. I was working quickly and juxtaposing colors like never before. The result was the discovery of beautiful marks, passages, and patterns on the way sheets that were created without a mindful plan. That assortment of garbage constitutes the base for my new project, translating the works of Scriabin onto painted grocery bags. I'll come up with a better title for the series. I've set up a few parameters and I'm actively exploring during the production of this video. My rules are relatively easy to follow. If I choose to collage, I can only use materials from the paste paper sessions. No trimming of edges, that's where the good stuff is happening. I'm not looking at the musical scores of the pieces I'm translating. I don't want it to be that literal. And I'm limiting the use of recognizable musical references to lines and circles. I've chosen a few of my favorite Scriabin compositions to work with, and I'm matching those up with waste sheets that resonate. After that, I'm going in and adding or subtracting. To finish each work, I'm taking my guidance from the composer himself and making sure the color he designated for the work's key signature is well defined. The challenge now is to keep the rational at bay and maintain spontaneity. I end my reflections on collage by returning to André Breton and then to Tom Cassidy performing his poem Collage, a piece that reunites all of this art-speak abstract conceptualism with our everyday lives. It is also the source for the title of this video. Nadia by André Breton is one of the iconic works of the French Surrealist movement. It begins with the question, who am I? and is based on Breton's interactions with a young woman, Nadia, who is presumed mad, but Breton considers her a potential surrealist. The short novel recounts the relationship's 10-day lifespan through a non-linear structure. In this passage, Breton prompts an apprehensive Nadia to create a narrative. A game, say something. Close your eyes and say something anything, a number, a name. Like this, she closed her eyes. Two. Two what? Two women. What do they look like? Wearing black. Where are they? In a park. And then, what are they doing? 
Try it. It's so easy. Why don't you want to play? You know, that's how I talk to myself when I'm alone. I tell myself all kinds of stories. And not only silly stories. Actually, I live this way altogether. Here, Breton is trying to create a surrealist. For me, the conversation prompts the question, can you teach collage? The short answer is no. The long answer is not really. You can provide an environment that facilitates the process of creativity, supply physical materials, lecture on art history, making sure to include those disregarded by archaic scholars, talk about what adhesives are pH neutral, if that really matters, and conduct exercises that arouse spontaneous free association. But as an instructor, you cannot manufacture a collage artist. The best you can do is encourage their assemblage of new realities that possess content even they might not fully understand. Here's a poem I wrote in January 2009. It's called Collage. Bills and junk mail, the book I read on the plane, a magazine to finish later, luggage, the extra house key our neighbor had, all need to get put away. But right now, as the space between here and there widens, everything, I mean everything, right now is where it needs to be. But where it really needs to be is someplace else. A hot plate, three folding chairs, the nice dishes, leftover hors d'oeuvres, a tablecloth that's 50 years old, all need to get put away. But right now, as the time between now and then narrows, everything, I mean everything right now, is where it needs to be. But where it really needs to be is someplace else. The hammer, a jar full of nails, electrical tape, a Phillips screwdriver I didn't end up needing after all, but you never know. A power strip for the hors d'oeuvres all need to get put away. But right now, as the will between the what and why mutates everything, I mean everything right now, each and every letter in this remote transit word, this hurdle, is where it needs to be. But where it really needs to be is someplace else. Chairs on fire. Piles of unpaid tickets for using the language improperly, or is that incorrectly, things I wish I could repair things I wish I could repair. The albatross on the porch, that poster of reminders for better daily living that's written very poorly by someone who is a better person than I am, all need to get put away. But right now, as the arc between the real and unreal spreads, everything, I mean everything right now, each impossibly ragged thought for which I will need the Phillips screwdriver after all, now and later, there and then, is where it needs to be. But where it really needs to be is someplace else. Coupons from the circular, the burning chairs receipt I'll give to the tax guy, my old Be Here Now t-shirt, which is a funny thing to list. I mean, how big is here after all? And how long is now? Besides my new t-shirt, Beer Here Now is easier to swallow. A collection of spoons that everyone adds to but no one wants. The laundry basket, a deck of cards, potting soil, those glaciers, things forgotten, all need to get put away. But right now is the knot between fear and faith loosen everything. I mean everything right now. Stuff for the garage sale. Your shadow on the moon is where it needs to be. But where it really needs to be is someplace else. We're waiting for the commercial. <laughs>